And welcome to episode number 17 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris. Joining me today is Shane. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. And Shane and I, we are amateur astronomers, and we are basically doing this. Uh, we've done this before, but we have started this up again during the pandemic because we enjoy chatting about astronomy and sharing our love of the night sky and actually looking at the universe ourselves with other people. And we just haven't been able to get together for a beer, basically. This is what we're doing instead. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also, like, you know, we both love podcasts. And yeah. there's just not a lot of podcasts out there that talk about the actual kind of amateur observing, like actually looking through the telescope. There's lots that talk about the history and the science and various other aspects, but not many that talk about getting out and doing some observing. And, and really, that's the niche we're trying to fill here. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a tight niche. So we're not, uh, you know, we're not looking for the 100,000 uh, downloads an episode. And we're really happy to see that we're up into the, uh, you know, a couple or a few dozen um, or more now, I guess, like some of them are getting up to 50 or 60 uh, downloads per podcast. So it's it's really exciting to see that. And we, we thank everybody who is listening and we hope you enjoy it as much as uh, we've enjoyed doing them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ditto to all of that. <laughs> Good stuff. So Shane, Last week, you said, and you have to be honest here, you have to give me your honest opinion, last okay. week when you suggested or, or mentioned that this would be the podcast topic for this week, which is planning a dark sky observing session, did you sense any hesitation on my part about doing this as a podcast topic? Just a little. <laughs> <laughs> just so, just a little, yes. I thought, because we weren't recording at that time, and I know it's like the end of the it's sort of like the end of the day for us. And, and, and I was like, I, I should have explained that a little bit more. So, you know, I, I didn't grow up here and I know here in Saskatchewan, you, all you Saskatchewanians, you, you grew up camping and doing all oh, And yes. I didn't, you know, my father's a camper, like, and he loves to go out and do that stuff. And, uh, and we'd go out a few times when I was a kid, but my mother wasn't as much a fan of that. And, uh, you know, so I never really did that much. Like we spent tons of time outside, like loads of time outside doing stuff, not as much on the camping. So I really had to learn to camp uh, only to do astronomy uh, back east. You know, I would, I would, you know, just get a pretty inexpensive tent and just take it out and, and uh, kind of set it up and just at the star party kind of once a year and maybe once or twice when it looked like we had just the best conditions. Um, but just like very bare bones, like set up the tent, just crash, sleep for a few hours, get up and drive home kind of thing. Not like going out and camping for the weekend like we do. And I actually found that the, like it was a lot of added stress <laughs> to actually really um, get all that kind of gear together on top of getting the gear together for going to do astronomy. So getting the gear together to go to astronomy for a night is really that that can be fairly intensive loading up anyway and then adding on all the tents and sleeping stuff and cooking gear like on top of that i found very stressful <laughs> yeah it, well it, it adds a lot to you know your your process of getting ready um, certainly more preparation is required and you know i think you also have to have a love of the destination yeah. Because it's, it's more than just astronomy at that point. You know, there's, there's a whole day that you have, <laughs> you know, in these destinations. And, um, it, you know, if you don't like being there or if you don't like that kind of, um, I guess, integration with nature, eh, you know, it, it, it can be a little too much, I suppose. Yeah. And the, the other thing, and you've really helped me with this, you know, and like, like I said, I, I continue to uh, improve my my camping skills, but they'll never be what what they would be if I was somebody who who did really just go out and camp. I don't do that as much. My wife's actually the big camper of the two of us, as you know. But uh, is uh, is the paring down of things and and getting some quality camping gear? Because when I was first doing this out east, I just would get the really low end stuff, and the tents wouldn't breathe well, so you'd wake up damp or too cold. And and I mean, if it was dry, it would be very cold, and you don't have um, the right kind of sleeping gear for, for handling that kind of weather. So, I mean, you and I have kind of uh, gone back and forth quite a bit. And I, I think you've kind of schooled me in some of this, particularly with the buying of, of a really good uh, sleeping mat, um, which I, I can't thank you enough for. It was very expensive, but um, nothing beats getting a good night's sleep when you're doing this stuff. And then, you know, 
I think that's almost like a topic for, for another podcast is kind of really the best camping gear for, for doing astronomy. Cause we really get it down so that I can almost take all of my camping gear out in one go. I know exactly what I'm taking. I have, um, a kit for my cooking stuff, sleeping bag, pad, pillow, boom, like, and like, that's it. And then my tent is really small. So I just take it whichever trip of those is, is the smallest. So. Yeah. And, and when we do these trips, like, so this is uh you know, about a three hour drive from our house where we go to one of the darkest places in Canada, maybe North America to uh, do some observing. Um, we stay up pretty late, you know, because when it's warmer outside, you know, May, June, well, we don't go in June, but May, July, August, even uh, September. Well, not so much September, but it doesn't get dark until quite late in the day. Yeah. Uh, so you really don't start observing till maybe 11 p.m. or midnight is when it gets uh, nice and dark. And then you typically will go until it starts to brighten a little bit in the east. So, you know, we can be observing till three in the morning, maybe even four sometimes is pushing it. Um, so your, the amount of sleep that you actually get on these trips is, is very little. <laughs> so, you know, my, my philosophy is do everything that we can to have a, a restful few hours of sleep. Um, and that goes to having, you know, the right gear, uh, sleeping, uh, pads, tents, that kind of stuff to make sure that, um, you know, you can have a, a little bit of a rest and then enjoy the next day. So I've kind of broken... You know, and I know you've done some notes as well. And like, it is a good practice because typically last weekend would have been the first weekend we, we'd be out uh, yep. at a remote site going through this. Uh, so I kind of broke these into close in, like close in observing, like places that we go just for the night. Um, we observe for usually like two or three hours or, you know, depending on the weather, sometimes shorter. Uh, if it really, really is good and we're well rested and have to work the next day, then it can be longer. But um, those are close in, the far out ones. Um, you know, it's a little bit more gear intensive because we're going to be going staying overnight. We're going to be packing camping gear. Um, and typically we're not coming back. We're going to go for at least one night. Usually we're going to aim for two and then sometimes we'll even, even do three nights. So that's kind of how I, I broke it down. And then I just sort of was going to start with some general stuff here. And I didn't know if we, you just wanted to kind of start with the, the general stuff that you might have, or, or if you wanted to talk about why we don't go observing in June. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, well, maybe just some general stuff for, and this is applicable to any observing session. Always check the phase of the moon. Um, I think we've said it before on other podcasts, but if there's any visible moon in the sky, it's probably not worth driving out of the city to a dark location uh, because the moon will wash out the sky and make it like it's light polluted from the city anyway. So those nights just stay in your backyard. So yeah. always check the phase of the moon and plan to go out uh, either during new moon or when the moon has a favorable rise and set time that it won't disrupt your observing. So check that. Check your weather forecast. You know, if it's going to be cloudy or windy or maybe too cold, um, you know, those are things that will keep us at home. And, um, uh, you know, if you've got mosquitoes, you know, you got to think about that kind of stuff. Um, and then the other thing I like to mention is, um, you know, this isn't, this doesn't necessarily apply to the backyard observing, but anything that where you're traveling is take a look at what the temperature will be while you're observing. And I like to say dress for 15 to 20 degrees centigrade below that temperature. Um, because that's one thing that most people don't, um, don't really understand until they do it. And that's when you're standing uh, not moving, looking through a telescope without a sun or any other sort of heating source, um, you get cold. And once you get, you know, that kind of chill inside of you, that will end your night. You know, you'll go home or you'll go into your tent and sleep. And uh, I always like to bring, you know, a big parka, uh, with like a winter parka for July observing sometimes, because if it's getting down to, say, plus 10 centigrade, uh, I want to dress like it's minus 10. Um, and then I know I'll be comfortable. Yeah. And, you know, it's a really good point. Um, you know, when I first started doing this, I would just go out and, and like my jeans, even in, even in the winter. Right. And you, it's just, the clock is ticking for how long you can actually, uh, stay out for. And, uh, my first observing partner, uh, uh, Graham, uh, he was like, what are you doing, man? Like, you've got to get a pair of, you know, like lined snow pants to wear when we go out and do this. Cause, 
I want to go for more than an hour, an hour and a half. Like, and you're kind of wanting to pack it in after an hour because your legs are too cold. And, you know, just get a pair. So went out to like just Marks or somewhere like that and got a pair that were on sale and boom, like you, you're going to almost double your observing time. Like you wear the proper um, gear when you go out. And then the other thing is, is that, and this is the thing that I've learned is that um, you get cold and now typically like a lot of this, the camping gear is designed for more summer observing, right? Uh, Cause you're going out in the summer. But when we're out observing and that body temperature drops and you go and get in a tent and a sleeping bag on a sleeping pad, that's all designed for summer observing. You don't have that heat. Now people that are hiking and then they're eating dinner and then hopping into their, their tent and, and sleeping bag when it's still maybe 12 or 15 degrees out and they haven't chilled off, they're able to kind of warm up that bag and warm up their, their tent enough. And, you know, they sleep through and get up and they don't know that it went to, I mean, you know, we've seen below zero temperatures uh, all months of the year here now, I think, or close to it. Um, but, you know, we don't have that luxury. You know, sometimes we're going to bed and it's one or minus one, or one day it was minus four when I went to bed and I'm getting into a sleep bag that, although it's rated for, uh, almost that temperature, you're, you're at the limit already, but you're getting in and your body temperature is already starting to drop. You're at like 36 and a half degrees Celsius and you're going to have a lot of trouble warming that tent and sleeping bag up. Uh, so you need to kind of even uh, bone that stuff up. Because I think those mats that, that we now use that, that you found and eventually uh, after I set up my former mat on a, on a cactus, uh, end up getting, uh, those ones are rated for like minus 40 or minus 50 or something like that, I think. Yeah, they have a pretty high R value to insulate you from the ground and uh, prevent any convection currents uh, in the in the pad from cooling you off as well. So yeah, they work quite well. Yeah, um, a few of the things that I'm going to mention right off the top is because I've noticed these are kind of annoyances um, is uh, for people to, especially if you're going to be observing with other people, but even if you're observing on your own, is to red out your interior car lights or make sure you know where the off switches are and have them off. Um, and you want to be using red light at night because that uh, has the least amount of impact on your and other people's night vision. And then building on that, make sure you know either A, how to turn off your blinky blinky lights on your uh, car alarm system uh, or know how to disable it. Because chances are like, you know, if you're observing in the places like we are, no one's breaking into your car anyway. And it's, it's really annoying when people are, are showing up and they have like super bright ones now, it seems. Uh, not really sure why that is. Well, and, and that's a great point because it's something that when you're, you know, in the city and you park your vehicle in your driveway or at a restaurant, uh, you don't really notice how bright that light is because there's a million other lights all around you. When you get to a, a place where that's the only light that you see, it's shocking how, uh, yeah, I guess annoying or how bright it is, right? And you don't, it's just an awareness thing that, you you know, until you see it, uh, you, you, you might not even think about it and then yeah you know, it's, you know it's too late when you're at the dark site so. yeah and like on my car like there's just like it's knowing where those dimmers are like oftentimes people don't even use those but you know like i made sure that uh, like when i got a new car a couple of years ago like first time we're going out like i know how to dim them as as far down as possible really and then you know how to cover up the other ones and that sort of stuff because you know it's impossible to do every last little thing but you just don't want it impacting your night vision and and especially those those around you so you know if yeah, you other... go ahead oh sorry yeah no? just one little thing that i do in my truck is uh i i cannot turn off my gauge lights so like no matter what i do when i open the door the gauge lights come on uh, so what I've done is I just have a blanket that I stuff up kind of in that area of the dash. So when we're observing, uh, that light can come on, but nobody will ever know. So sometimes you have to get sort of creative with yeah. some, you know, bubble gum and, and uh, duct tape or whatever to, to make it work. Yeah. And that, you know, that makes, makes total sense. It, it's, this is easy stuff to mitigate, but if you get out there and you, and you don't, you know, it's just like, like you say, like a towel or a little blanket or whatever it is, just grab that, throw that in you know, it's almost like nothing, but if you don't have that and you get out there and they're like saturating everybody's eyes with white light, you're the least uh, popular observer on the field that night. So yeah, for sure. So some of the other things that, that I have on here, I'm not going to go over every last little thing, but um, one thing that we do, like me and you and Mike, we do this a lot and people, I, I find people come observing with us and they're like, what are you guys doing? We have all those chairs. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we have all these like reclining lawn chairs. 
And uh, I love these things. So I have one, uh, this, I'm on my second one now from, I think mine's a, an Eddie Bauer or similar, but you can buy them from like Tommy Bahama or different places. And they allow you to, to recline, they're very low to the ground. Well, like a beach beach chair of some yeah, kind. Yeah, basically, yeah, like a beach chair or like some sort of camping chair. But but these ones actually recline so that you you can kind of get a little bit further back. And then we like to sit in those uh, to use with our binoculars. And then um, you can also kind of straighten them up a bit for just sitting around camp. And they're actually a lot more comfortable than a regular camping chair anyway. And because we're not really getting up and hiking around all day as much, uh, having a more comfortable camping chair uh, I find makes makes for a better uh, weekend experience than just like those fifteen dollar canvas and uh, and metal specials that you get. Those aren't really more comfortable uh, uh, than what, than what we want. And they're pretty hard on your back to kind of lean back into. They're not ergonomic. You kind of hunch over in them, so they're really not great for actually doing astronomy out of uh, as much as the ones that we're describing. Yeah, no, totally agree. Um, um, having having a comfy chair, I guess, sounds simple, but uh, I, they're, they're, you have to have one. It, it helps uh, during the day and at night. So some of the things that have really tripped me up um, is those little hex keys. And I have tons of those. You, if you've ever been in my car and you're like, what, what are all these hex keys? <laughs> like, it's because I'm always buying them and losing them in my car. And then I find them and throw them into the dash. Like there's always like all kinds of little hex keys around. I have like a big set at home and different ones because a lot of the astronomical um, dovetail plates and rings, uh, they require the hex keys. And I've gotten out to sites before only to realize that, oh darn, like some of my uh, rings have become loose or once my focuser had become loose. And it's really nice to be able to kind of tighten that down when, you, when you're actually in the field or to have uh, some of the other tools that, that you might need for your gear. So whatever you need to uh, to make minor adjustments to the gear or make sure it's secure, especially after long trips down bumpy roads, uh, definitely something worth bringing. You know, that's a great point. Um, I I now do bring a little toolkit with, uh, you know, a screwdriver and some pliers, just some basics. Yeah. Um, and one time I went observing and uh, this is when I had a Dobsonian. So I had the lower tube assembly with the primary mirror in its wooden base in the back of an SUV. And this was just going down paved roads. This wasn't even um, on any gravel, uh, but it's a, I think about a four hour drive that vibration rattled loose all of my collimation bolts uh, oh, no. right out of the, the mirror cell like, and springs were everywhere and it was such a mess and I didn't have any tools to put it back together. Um, I couldn't use my 12 inch uh, Thompsonian while I was at the dark site. Uh, yeah. Thank goodness I had brought my little uh, William Optics uh, refractor, so I was able to still get some observing done. Yeah. Um, but you know, it highlights the the point um, that having some tools um, may save you a little bit because <laughs> there's there's nothing worse than going on an astronomy trip and then not being able to do any astronomy because your gear's not working. That's right. And speaking of being saved, the one thing, the, although I I was a little bit early on the bringing of the tool bit. Um, Speaking of being saved, <laughs> you were much early on in making sure that uh, we have a good uh, medical kit on hand. And that certainly is something I've had to put my hands into on more than one occasion now, I think. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just, it's sort of second nature whenever I go hiking or fishing or whatever I do outdoors, I, I take a little bit of a first aid kit. And, you know, some of this depends too on the remoteness of your destination, yeah. where we go observing um you know, there's a, it's called a r rural municipality in our province, but it's similar to like a county. And um, there's one gas station in the entire rural municipality where we observe. And it's extremely desolate there. So you kind of have to be self-sufficient. And when we go down there and make sure we have a, a good first aid kit in yeah. case uh, something happens. Yeah, no, and I know. And I definitely appreciate that uh, on the two occasions where I inadvertently uh, grabbed a really hot part of my stove. Um, and having some Tylenol or any kind of antacids or that sort of thing can come in handy, uh, to like, even just like when we're going out, like to a close insight, I always try to make sure that I have a couple Advil, uh, or Tylenol or whatever in the car, because sometimes, you know, you don't think about it, like you're, you're working or whatever, um, particularly during the week, maybe I've got a bit of a headache. Um, but you're kind of just like, whatever, like, if, you know, regular day, you're not really thinking much about it. 
And I've, I've had on more than one occasion, you know, pack up all my gear, I'm driving out and I'm thinking, man, this headache is now really starting to become like a problem. And then like I get out to the observing site and I'm like, well, now I just don't like, I'm just not feeling good. Like I'm not, mm -hmm. it's just bad enough. Like, you know, I always say like kind of in a way doing astronomy can be the last thing that you want to do. Like, you know, if you're really tired or not well or something, you're like, I just don't want to do it tonight. It has to be fun. Right. So, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, like, you know, that just even taking like one ibuprofen is going to fix you up. But if you don't have it, your night's wrecked. And so after that, I was like, you know what, just always make sure I've got a couple in the car somewhere. And, you know, ever since I've been doing that, I don't think I've even had to take it. So, but it, it just really is unfortunate when you get into a situation or like you get like a little cramp or something, you know, and you, you know, taking something like that is going to, going to fix you right up. So one of the other things that I was thinking about when you kind of put this to me as like really going through everything is and here in Saskatchewan, particularly not where I come from, where I come from, you want to go camping, you just go, you show up and you're going to get a spot. Not so much here in Saskatchewan. If you're going camping somewhere, uh, for the most part, you're going to be reserving spots and, uh, or sometimes you might have to pay dues to go observing at a, at a club site or something like that. So uh, you may have to go through that kind of process too. And, and people uh, can forget to do that for one reason or another, or like, for example, in the grasslands, we have a, have a great partnership with the grasslands. So it's really worth our, our time and effort to make sure like we know who's coming with us so that we can let the grasslands know. And then sometimes they'll say, Hey, you know, if you guys are going to do astronomy, we recommend going here tonight because um, there's like a family gathering in this other place and they're probably going to put up lots of lights and be eating dinners late and that kind of thing. So um, it does pay uh, to kind of call ahead and make sure that uh, you're going to be able to, to do what you want to do and not interfere with other people or not have them interfere with you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great advice. When, when you go out, Chris, do you like to know which objects you plan on looking at that night or do you just show up and start looking at random areas or random objects in the sky? So like, so like I'm a little bit split on this. Yeah. Um, so sometimes I won't have a plan, I guess is, is what it comes down to. Like how much planning am I, am I putting in? Um, now I work on these projects, as you know, and, and they can be, well, they're very long, like years long projects that I'm working on here. And, and sometimes it is, it has to be fun. And if I just don't feel like working on it, like it's not my job, this is what I do when I'm not doing work and this is not meant to be work. And a lot of the time I'll just say, you know what, I'm just going, what are you looking at, Shane? I'm going to look at that stuff tonight, you know? And then yeah, yeah. you might be looking at, I remember one night and, and here's the thing is that you can over plan for astronomy. And I know some people that are just going to plan out everything and, you know, and that's cool. That's, that's really great. And it, it works for them and I get nothing against that. But like, I remember one night, um, it's very early on, we were observing together and I really didn't have a plan one night. And so, um, but it was one of my favorite nights observing um, one thing that happened was, I forget the name of the meteors that were coming in, but it wasn't like a major shower. It was early, earlier in July. And, um, and I was just sitting there watching meteors with Rick and they're like a particular kind of meteor shower where they, they just kind of skim the atmosphere. And he was, I don't know, I'm not really a meteor observer, but he's like telling me about them because this is what he's doing. And I'm just like tagging along. He's telling me about these meteors and he knew all about them. And where they originated from, like the whole history of them. And we're just watching these things come in. It was really, really cool. And then you were, while we were doing this, you were hunting down that, uh, what was it, like a globular cluster or something in M31 in Andromeda Galaxy? Mm, yeah, 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 I think so. Uh, I can't remember which one now, like G28 or something like that. Something like that. or I, mean, I For some reason, I thought it was G13, but I'm probably just thinking like M13. But um but you know, like you were hunting that down. That's something I always wanted to look at. I never really had made a plan to ever see it. You need a little bit bigger telescope. And at the time, that's what you were using. And then you hunted that down. So I kind of went over to you and, and we made an observation of that. And I just thought, wow, like that was cool. Like, so that night I had no plans, but that was one of my favorite nights observing. But then sort of on the flip side, last year we went out, I had that really, you'll remember this, I had that really detailed plan. And I had that's one of my favorite nights. Yeah. Carry yeah, on, yeah, exactly. So I, I'm not sure if, if I scuttled your plans that night or not, but I was like, you know, it'd be really fun to kind of do this together tonight. And, and I kind of had it all scripted out. And then I, 
I wrote it up into the article for the Observer's Handbook, and and I put it out in in that format that I do every year. Um, so, like I said, I, I can kind of go either way. I, I like to play it a little bit easy. Um, sometimes I have to um, do some observations to produce some of the work that I volunteer to do. Um, but for the most part, yeah, I, I just try to work on my long-term projects. But how about you, Shane? Like, I think you you tend to like to create some sort of lists and and have a variety of different objects to look at. Yeah, I used to be really rigid. Like I would, uh, like I completed my Messier quite a while ago, my Messier list, and then started working on a couple of others. Um, and whenever I would go out, I would be very focused and I, I would just sit in my chair at the eyepiece and observe a number of objects, as many as I could uh, in the night. Um, but then as I, you know, I, I still like to have some level of, uh, I guess, organization to my observing, but I'm far less formal now. And I really enjoy walking around to the other telescopes because yeah, we usually observe, you know, in pairs or Mike will come or Rick will come. Like there's usually a few of us observing. So it's kind of neat to see what everybody's looking at. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do like to have a, a little bit of an idea, at least a, a couple objects that I want to see that night. Um, and I'm, you know, typically they're new objects that I haven't seen before. Um, and then I just let the night take me in whatever direction it goes. And sometimes it's just looking at some of the, you know, showpiece bright objects like M31 or M13 or, you know, M27, the, you know, the list goes on, uh, cause those are fun to look at. And I enjoy looking at those, um, whenever, whenever the sky presents itself, but, um, yeah, for the most part, just whatever happens, happens. I will say though, like, uh, you know, I do like to observe an object, which means I don't just have a quick look and move on. I, I like to take it in, sometimes try different magnifications, uh, maybe try some different filters just to see if it changes the appearance of the object and allows me to see some other details. Um, so with that being said, you know, in the course of say a three or four hour observing session, I might only really observe four or five, maybe, you know, up to eight objects, but it's not a lot, you know, because I do spend time talking to the other astronomers, looking through their telescopes, and then, you know, taking some detailed observations of uh, the objects that I liked or that I wanted to look at. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, he can get really carried away with just trying to, like, sort of max out, like, the number of objects that, that one is looking at. And, you know, I, I really think before I started observing with you and Mike, I, I probably, and I always thought that I, I was looking at an appropriate number and I would always be trying to look at maybe 10 or 12 objects in a night. But then I remember we started observing with Mike, we went out one night, he spent the whole night looking at M101. And mm -hmm. I was like, what is this guy? And, but you know, I'd go over and I'd look at it and we were pulling out like those H2 regions. And then I think, I think the thing I was thinking about is you and I end up doing a podcast on that, like way back, like eight or 10 years ago. Um, I don't know if you recall this or not, but we were out at that, that hill by the cell tower. Oh, that was a great night. Yeah. Yeah. But we just looked at, I think we just really looked at, you know, like other than like kind of scanning around a bit on our own, but we spent a long time looking at, uh, I think it was M101 that night. And maybe, well, or was it 51? I thought it was 51. Was it 51? Okay. Maybe it was. Yeah. Cause we, we were taking in the right. spiral arms yeah, and there might even have been a supernova in there at that time. I think you're right. Yeah. Now that I, yeah, it's, it's a long time and I'm just kind of thinking of this sort of off the top of my head while we're chatting here, but yeah, I'm, I'm certain that you're right that it was M51. I think you're right. It was, there was a supernova there. And I think, I think we hunted that down or I hunted that down in my five inch as well. And whatever instrument you had, I think we all kind of had a look at it, but then Mike had his, uh, had his 12 working pretty good at that time. We, uh, we had some nice long, long views through, through that. So, so yeah, well, that's cool. Well, you know, what I find is that when, when we're observing close in and that was like still kind of like a close in uh, session. Um, often what I'll do is I'll either pick binoculars or a telescope to take because I find when we're doing those shorter sessions and sometimes they can be as short as maybe even an hour, an hour and a half. Like if it's really cold, you and I have done, I think you and I have done sessions down to the minus forties. And certainly when we're doing that, you know, we love to get out, love to get some starlight, but they're not going to be, hours long sessions some of those sessions we've just done with binoculars mm -hmm. yeah exactly yep and then when we're going somewhere uh like into the grasslands or we're going to drive really far and do some camping and observing we're taking the binoculars we're taking the telescopes sometimes you're taking your solar telescope to kind of do something during the day taking lots of books you know because we're going to be around during the day it's fun to kind of 
be reading a book and then kind of think, hey, maybe I'm going to look at this tonight. You know, it's really like you're able to kind of get inspired to look at something and then make a bit of a plan to actually go and, and look at that object. Even it might modify your own uh, uh, personal uh, browsing experience for the evening coming up. Absolutely. You know, and, and one of the things like outside of the, the pristine dark skies of say going to a location like Grasslands National Park in Canada is um, the, the thing or the other thing that I love most about it is we observe until we're barely able to keep our eyes open anymore because we're yeah. so tired. Yeah. And then we walk six feet over to our tent or, you know, camping trailer. If, if, if Mike is, uh, you know, if that's Mike's uh, uh, sleeping Abode. Yeah. Um, Thank, I, thankfully just, he brings that. It's so nice to have that shelter. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just so nice to be able to do that and, and then wake up the next day and, you know, have a coffee and, and breakfast and, and, you know, away you go. Yeah. Um, Cause the thing I hate most about astronomy is when you drive outside of the city uh, and you're coming home that night, Yeah. you know, you kind of have to balance the well, I'm not tired now, but I better go home now before I'm too tired to drive. Yeah. And, you know, if you're leaving the city, you're probably driving about an hour. So it's not like it's a short drive. Yeah. Uh, so I, that's what I love about the tenting aspect is it's just, it's so relaxing and you maximize your time observing because you go until it's bedtime. Well, the other thing I find is that like, like typically I'm okay for, for maybe two or three or close to three hours of driving, but not quite. And, and our nearest spot in the grasslands is, is at about that three hour distance. And I find like, I'm okay for that, but whether I do like an hour and a half or close to a three hour drive, I kind of feel like in a way that experience is about the same. And if I have to go and drive like an hour and a half, I know one of the sites that we used to use was like an hour and a half away. It was an awesome site, but we go, we drive that hour and a half, do our observing and then drive home. And we, after we did that a few more times, said well, we might as well just be driving down into the grasslands. And then like, instead of, you know, cause you're so wrecked the next day anyway from that drive. And then the debate is always, well, like what night are we going to go observing? Which night looks best? Cause it's hard to do that two nights in a row. But if you go down to the grasslands, well, you're really committing to doing those two nights and the amount of money that you're spending on gas or just drive time is all neutrally buoyant at that point anyway, because you're sort of one for one. And then it's hard to pick that best night. Like you're bound to pick a lot of the wrong nights, you know, and then yeah, yeah. things can come up too. Like when you and I have it on the calendar, like this is the weekend we're going, then it's on the calendar. Our spouses know. We, we have it in the plan and we're all good. Whereas if we're just like saying something like, well, we'll try to get out that month. Well, some nights we do, some months we don't, and it becomes a little bit more variable and like less, less committed. Yeah, no, that's a great point too, for sure. Um, yeah, it, there's so many things that can come up, particularly the weather, you know, we, we start with great intentions and fingers crossed, but often the weather gets in the way. <laughs> yeah. I got a couple more things here. So rain gear. Okay. Now, I actually think that I've never really used much in the way of rain gear since I moved here because it doesn't really rain. Like you probably think it rains here, but it doesn't really rain. Here. <laughs> like, let me tell you, like it can rain. But I remember even um, on nights where I drove down to grasslands in the rain, it actually typically cleared up. And I've had a few rainy nights there, but I think maybe three or four in the uh, 10 years I've been doing this here and in Nova Scotia where I'm from, you'd be lucky to only have three or four that year when you're doing this. Right. So right, right. If I was doing this the way uh, we do it here. One piece of equipment um, that I mentioned, this sounds like sort of a strange thing, but I found this was a real game changer with my observing. Now, sometimes I'll take it when we're going uh, nearby, but oftentimes I'll just sort of observe out of my back seat or whatever. Um, but if we're going out to dark skies, I take a little table with me for, mm. for my, uh, observing gear, like my eyepieces and everything. Cause I do have a tray on my telescope, but you know, we've got a lot of stuff. It's nice to have a little table to put your stuff out on. And then, you know, it's handy to have to, to cook on. Cause sometimes it's hard to get out of the wind. So sometimes you can find like a little spot, uh, behind a building or make a little spot behind your vehicle to use. And then you're not trying to cook in your car and you know, I've cooked in the cars and cooked on tailgates and all kinds of things in the past. So uh, having that little observing table or just a little table that you can pick up for 30 or 20 bucks at, uh, at a, 
hardware store or whatever, that is super handy, I find anyway. Yeah, for sure. You know, and, and obviously when what we're talking about, just some general car camping principles apply. But, you know, we put a little bit of an astronomy twist on this because, um, yeah, you, it's, you'll probably bring a camping table for your grill or whatever, but yeah. we use the tables all night for star charts, eyepieces, filters, you know, they become a real important accessory for us. Yeah. You kind of do have to also like, I, I do bring a few more weights with me. So I, like if I'm using it for my cooking, uh, you know, like I tend to make a pretty big mess when I cook. I'm not, I'm not like a really good camper like you guys are. Um, so I'm like waping it down after I do that and kind of letting it dry a bit. Um, and then using it at night. So I'm not getting like chilly in my observing box and stuff like that. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> the one thing I'll take, so if, if I'm observing close in, typically I'll take maybe a pencil or two for my sketching. And mm -hmm. usually what I do is I sharpen them up. I might take an eraser, but it's, it's very, very, very bare bones. Um, and then just a small pad. But if we're going out somewhere far, usually what I'll do is I'll bring like uh, maybe five or six pencils, my eraser, my blending stub, because sometimes I'll actually do some observing at night. And then, you know, I, I do field observation notes um, and like a study. So it's very rough. And like I was sharing that other image with you uh, early this morning and, and they're rough. Like I think it gets the message across, like the detail is captured, but I'm not really focused on making a good circle. I'm just focused on making notes. And I think they're rough. They're, they're too rough, but I can kind of clean them up during, during the day. And sometimes I might do that. And then I know like sometimes like you're sort of the astrophotographer. So you might uh, bring a camera, mm -hmm. with you, for example, and we go out and do those sessions versus the sessions in close, you will bring a camera once in a while. But if we're out there doing some observing, you've gone out and taken some great Milky Way shots. Yeah. You know, it, it it's a great point. Like I, I certainly add a little complexity to my packing, but when we do go a little further, I take a little more gear because we're there longer, but also there's just, uh, you know, I want to make sure that I'm taking full advantage of the trip. Um, and usually what I'll do if I'm doing some astrophotography like that is one night I will dedicate myself to just doing visual astronomy. Mm -hmm. So the camera will not come out because you're dealing with lights, like with the finder, you know, at the back, the little screen, um, so it's hard to keep your night vision, uh, preserved while doing the photography business. So then if, uh, if I'm bringing the camera night to then, or, or, you know, the night that has kind of the, the most marginal seeing conditions, that's the night when I will do the astrophotography and, mm. you know, very light visual observing. In fact, sometimes those nights I won't even put out a telescope. I'll just come to your guys's telescopes and see what you're looking at. Well, I remember one night, um, you know, when we used to camp in, in the backyard of the, of the old visitor center there yeah. and the night was pretty marginal. And I think everybody went to bed and you were like, well, I'm just going to stay up and just do some shots. I think you were trying to like work something out. And then the Aurora really kicked up and you got some really beautiful Aurora shots. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the, one of the neat things with the camera. Like there's even been some nights where uh, we look to the North and we're wondering if that is Aurora starting to brighten up. And if you take just like a five second exposure, you'll know right away whether there's Aurora there because it'll, it'll be very uh, evident in the picture. Um, and it can come out of nowhere. Uh, there's, there's forecasts that attempt to tell you if the Aurora will be bright or not, or, or even existent. Um, but they're highly, you know, I don't know what their reliability is, but um, we've had crazy Aurora when there's not been any Aurora forecast. Right. <laughs> so you never know what you'll get into. Well, it's so dark down there. Like typically if it's sort of quote unquote Aurora season, we've often, we've often seen Aurora there on most nights. Cause you know, for those that know what a limiting magnitude of, of seven sky is um, it's, it's like well into the sevens there for the mm -hmm. thickness of the stars that you can see. And as such, there, there's typically almost always some sort of aurora going on in the north, uh, especially, uh, you know, in that, in that springtime sky, it seems. And so typically once it's dark enough, we will see some glow uh, to the north, which was very strange when I first moved here. And I saw that because I knew this was one of the darkest places uh, on the earth. And, and I saw this glow. I'm like, what's going on? There must be light pollution. And they're like, there's no cities up that way at all until you get to like, the North Pole like there's just nothing in that direction and it turns out that yeah it's it's the Aurora so I just got like a couple more things here that I sort of had on my list that we didn't really touch on um oh yeah 
bring your medications. Like if people have medications to take and you're going really far, uh, make sure you take your medications. And uh, let's see, uh, caffeinated beverages. Like I know you're a tea drinker, I'm more of a coffee drinker. And the one thing that, that I found, which was a game changer, and I found this by watching camping videos because I'm not really a camper, is to uh, get those Starbucks instant coffees, which I think actually are pretty decent coffees as it is. Um, I'm typically someone that grinds my own coffee in the morning and makes coffee in a French press. So that's sort of my background. Um, these aren't as good as that, but the Starbucks, uh, especially the French roast instant coffee, and they're like a little tube. So you boil your water uh, or you throw that in your cup, boil your water and throw your water and hot water on top of that and you give it a stir and, and it's, I think it's, especially camping, I think it's good enough. Um, you know, I know Mike will bring his, uh, his little grinder and really make us up some stuff. So, you know, I got to say that if I ever do really feel like I want some good coffee, then usually there is some good coffee on hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And I've, uh, I've started to take up a little bit of the coffee drinking and I don't know, when, when you're out camping like that, any you know, any luxuries are just so appreciated, whether it's a good cup of coffee or a nice meal, um, just because everything else is a little bit rougher. <laughs> yeah. And one thing that is not a luxury though, and this is sort of my, my last thing out of all this, stuff, I think you touched on most things that I had in my, my little list here is water. And especially where we go, which is a, uh, uh it's basically a desert like environment is what they call it. And, uh, you need a lot of water when you're out there. And even when I go observing at night before, very seldom would I take water observing with me. Out east, you can kind of get by. The odd time I would get thirsty or whatever, but it wasn't that big a deal. And typically what I would do is get like a coffee on my way out. And usually that, that was enough. But here, because we do get such dry conditions, which is awesome. Um, but I always take water with me when we're going observing. Even if we're just going out a short ways here, I'll at least take half a liter or a liter of water with me just in my water bottle because uh you can get so dry that you're like i'm just so thirsty i gotta go home like i've had that before here which never quite experienced before moving out yeah well and, and just staying up that much later um you know you're just drying out your body so if you're you know if you're not putting in some some liquids uh you're you're gonna get a little dehydrated yeah, I know exactly. And then down, like I said, where we go, when we go camping, um, it's easy to go through four or five liters a day, I find. Oh, yeah. Yeah, quite easy, for sure. No problem at all. Yeah. So, which is ridiculous, because even if I'm home, I know, I know that what I drink there in two days is probably equivalent to, you know, what I possibly might, might drink at home in, you know, 10 or 15 days, because I will just, I could just sit down there and drink water all day. I remember I took a flat of water down there and just, I was just drinking constant water down there. Um, especially that time I went down, it was 46 Celsius when you bailed on me, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a little warm. <laughs> that was so hot that you couldn't sleep on the ground anyway. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of, that's kind of my list. This is sort of like more or less, like we didn't really touch on it exactly. I mean, bring your red flashlights too. Like never forget those. Um, yeah, that's kind of, yeah. that's pretty much what I have. Yeah. The, maybe the, the only other thing that I'll add into this, cause uh, we've covered everything on my list too, is, um, where, like, again, where we go, it's a very beautiful place during the day as well as at night. And we stay up very late observing. And I think you and I have both made the mistake of doing like big grand, like five to 10 to 12 kilometer hikes during oh, the day yeah. to see the landscape. And it's wonderful. And I loved yeah. it. But then when it came time for astronomy, uh, I was in bed by midnight and yeah. I was so tired. I didn't enjoy any of the time even leading up to that. Yeah. Um, so you really have to pick your ditch, I think, on these trips. And, and now what we do is we basically sit in chairs all day and, you know, we socialize and we read some books and we try to have a nap, but it's all about the astronomy. Yeah. And, uh, if we try to fit in anything else, it really um, kind of jeopardizes, I think, the enjoyment of the actual astronomy because you're just too tired to do it. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, exactly. My very first time down there, I had, you know, because when we were just getting going and and the park itself was really just getting going and so i had arranged like a six or seven a.m hike and 
and my wife and I went and it was amazing. And the park interpreter came and, and Joanna and she, you know, took us on this hike that we never could have done on our own. And, and the park staff are awesome. And I've certainly done other hikes with the park staff since, and they are well worth it in the grasslands to arrange with the park staff. Like that is worth, I forget what they charge, but it's, it's not very much uh, seven or $8 or whatever it is. Well, well worth it. But if you do go and do that and you're planning to do astronomy, it's just not going to, you're just, it's, it's hard hiking. It's, it's not impossible hiking, but you're exerting yourself and yeah, you're right. You're just not going to be doing much astronomy. And I remember the first time we went down, I did that hike. And then that night when we were kind of on to do the public show, you're just so waped out, just so waped out. But uh, yeah, Ill, Ill advised to, to try to do too much during the day when you're really there to, to do the astronomy. Yeah, exactly. My, my, you know, what I do now is uh, go back to the park during full moon. <laughs> and then I, you know, I, I, I can do all of the things I want to do in the park during the daytime. And I'm not really there for astronomy. You know, I'm there just to enjoy the park. Right, exactly. And you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Like sometimes, you know, uh, I know we've observed with other people that uh, they get down there, they do one night, that's their astronomy night. And the next day they get up and they're going to go do all this hiking and all this stuff. And certainly, um, you know, some people will split it up like that and that's great. You know, it's great mm-hmm. that they're able to go and, and enjoy the park for, for all that it offers. And, and over time, you know, because we've been going down there so much anyway, we often have those nights where eh, it's not looking like it's going to be a good night, but we committed to being here all weekend anyway. So today go for that hike or, yeah. you know, do whatever and, uh, go for that drive around. And then, um, you know, if that night ends up good, well, we can do some astronomy, but you know, if, if it's not looking good anyway, well, we might as well, you know, enjoy your time down here because it is such a, such a beautiful place. So. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Very good. Well, anything else to add to this podcast? Shane? That's all I have, my friend. So we're going to wrap episode number 17 while we're coming up on 20. It's pretty exciting. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for listening. Excellent. And thank thanks. you, Chris. Thanks so much, Shane. All right. We'll talk to you soon. See you.